We're very pleased to have Brother Michael Hatcher with us, who's the preacher for the Bellevue Church of Christ in Pensacola, Florida. Brother Michael was born 1952 in Pensacola. He's the son of William C. Bill Reed and Peggy uh, Reed. It's a person I knew over in Austin. And uh, Peggy Hatcher. Will you be quiet over there? You know who he is. <laughs> he who laughs first, laughs last. <laughs> is a gospel preacher. He passed away in 1986. Uh, he was reared in Garland, Texas, Lubbock, Texas, and West Palm Beach, Florida. He's married to former Karen, Sav Karen Savage of Trenton, Texas. They have two sons, both of them are Christians, William Andrew and Daniel Michael. He was schooled in Harding College with a BA degree back in 1976. And I won't go into all the other details except to mention he's editor of The Defender, which is produced by the Bellevue Congregation and also director of the annual Bellevue Lectureship and their good editor of their good uh, bulletin, The Beacon. And he's a helps us in Truth Bible Institute. He's done work of that nature elsewhere as well as traveling overseas. Been on a number of lectureships, done a great deal of work for the Lord. We appreciate him, and now we want to come speak to us on Christ confronted error about the Holy Spirit. Brother Michael. I do want to express my appreciation, as many others have, for the elders of this congregation the wonderful job that they do and the soundness of this congregation the entirety of the congregation because without the congregation backing and supporting uh, work and of such as this you wouldn't have it all of those who work behind the scenes uh, it is greatly appreciated and I always enjoy coming and being with you and I even enjoy staying with uh, David and Jody. But uh, I, I almost, uh, it was almost uh, questionable whether the Age of Miracles was still in effect because last night we got to bed before 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> David's over there shaking his head, so yeah. <laughs> the, uh, You know, errors about the Holy Spirit are so numerous today. They're abounding both outside and sadly within the church for our Lord. So we can't deal with all of those, but what we hope to do in this lesson is at least give you a basis of understanding. And with that, then, the doctrinal errors that come about regarding this can be met. As a background for our study, you go back to Joel 2 and verses 28 through verse 32 in particular, and I'm not going to read that for lack of time, but here is a promise of the Spirit being poured out during the Christian age. This is fulfilled in the miraculous age of the New Testament when Christians received the, the Spirit either directly as the apostles did in Acts 2 and the Cornelius did in Acts 10th chapter or whether it was done indirectly that is by the laying on of the apostles hands let me just very briefly add though I believe it becomes a serious mistake to parallel the pouring out of the Spirit that Joel speaks of with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was a part of that pouring out of the Spirit, but the pouring out of the Spirit embraces more than simply the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I will say that I believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was only given to the apostles, and we'll get into that a little bit more later on. 
But we come along in time to John the Baptist. And in Matthew, the third chapter and verse 11, John states that he was baptizing in water and to repentance. And by the way, his baptism was for the remission of sins, by the way. There's a lot of people who don't understand that, but it was. But he says that there's one coming after him, Jesus, of course, that is mightier than he. And he would baptize you, he says, with the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost and with fire. Uh, it's an incorrect assumption to think that everyone is inclusive with those two statements of baptism of the Holy Spirit and baptism of fire. It is. Some would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Some would be baptized with fire. Uh, the full identity, though, of those who would be baptized of the Holy Spirit is going to be revealed to us later. Remember, inspiration... And revelation was progressive in nature. Not everything was given all at the same time. And so as we come along in the ministry of Jesus, we start learning that Jesus is going to limit that baptism with the Holy Spirit to the apostles. Look in Luke, the 24th chapter, verse 48 and verse 49. When Jesus says that ye are witnesses, and by the way, no one today is a witness in relationship to Christ or God or the Spirit or anything religious. This is referring to the apostles. Ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Now notice, and we'll see the parallel in this, that he talks about the promise of my Father, and he talks about the power from on high. These things are connected one with the other. But we also see, when we turn over to Acts first chapter, that that promise of the Father is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, verse 4 and 5, being assembled together with them, the them there has reference to the apostles. He's assembled, Jesus is, with the apostles. He commanded them, the apostles, that they, the apostles, should not depart out of Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of my Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. And we'll get into that heard of me uh, in just a moment. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Thus Jesus takes that which John had stated back here in, John, in Matthew 3, and he says it's applied to you, the apostles. And you are to wait in Jerusalem until you, be, until you receive that baptism of the Holy Spirit or that promise of the Father. And when they receive that baptism... They, the apostles, would be receiving the power. And you see that in verse 8 within that same context. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses of me, both in, the, in Jerusalem and in Judea and all Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. When the Holy Ghost has come upon you. When is that? That's when you receive that baptism of the Father or baptism of the Holy Spirit, or the promise of the Father. And when you receive that, you're going to receive power. And that's going to enable you to be witnesses, the apostles. But those three ideas, the promise of the Father, the receiving that power, and the baptism with the Holy Spirit, or in the Spirit, all have reference to that one and the same event of the apostles being baptized in the Holy Spirit. That promise thus of John in Matthew 3 is seen then in the fulfillment in Acts the second chapter. In verses 1 through 4 when the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles. And we see verse 4 there, they were they, the apostles, were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And so here's the fulfillment of that which 
John the Baptist had spoken of. But now then, let's go back a little bit to John the 14th, 15th, and 16th chapters. And at this time, it's shortly before Christ is going to be arrested, he's going to be crucified, and the events that go with that, he's going to be raised from the dead and ascend back to the Father. And he has now called his apostles to, him, to himself to discuss with them and to prepare them for the coming events. And he promises unto them, upon the condition of their love for him, as we would see in John 14, verses 15 through 17, he promises unto them that, that love him another comforter. Another showing that this spirit is not just a force or a power, but he is a person even as Jesus was. But then as he goes on in this discussion, we come over into the 16th chapter. And we want to look at verses 7 through verse 15. Because here is, I believe, the key in understanding, to a great extent, the aspect of the, several different aspects of the Spirit. When he tells his apostles, and nevertheless, it is, I tell you the truth, is it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet, <clears throat> see, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall, not re for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. In this, Jesus shows us and the apostles what the work of the Spirit is. The work of the Spirit is that of reproving. As King James puts it, American Standard, New King James, says convict. Here's the work of the Spirit. It is to convict. To convict the world of, or bring the world to an understanding of recognizing their wrongdoing. To convict, and that's the idea, the idea of convict or reprove to convict or refute everyone, bringing them to a sense of shame. That's the, the idea of that word. The conviction that he's talking about, or the reproving that he is talking about, involves three areas. Convicting of sin, convicting of second righteousness, and convicting third of judgment. When we're dealing with sin, we're dealing with the transgression of God's law. Remember 1 John 3 and verse 4, that whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. Well, here's the transgression of the law. That's sin. What is the Spirit going to do? He is convicting. He is reproving the world. He is bringing the world to a sense of shame in relationship to sin and transgressing God's will. Now, then Jesus mentions a specific sin in relationship to what he's discussing then, and that is the rejection of his Messiahship. They're going to reject me as being the Messiah, as being the Christ. What is it? Spirit is going to be doing the work in convicting them of sin. But then second, he says, the Spirit's work is that of convicting the world of righteousness. Righteousness, very simply, is the state of being right. It is when a judge would pronounce someone not guilty. Now, relating to God, it's the pronouncing of, by God, of one who is not guilty of sin. 
And thus, that individual is in a right relationship with God. In this case, or in our case, because our sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. But we'll get into that a little bit more. Here, Jesus mentions, though, the specific aspect of the righteousness of Christ. That he has been proven righteous. How is, was Christ produ or proven righteous? By the resurrection from the dead. Remember what Paul would write in Romans 1 and verse 4, that God hath declared Jesus to be his, the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of Jesus, or by the resurrection from the dead. Because he was raised from the dead, I know that Jesus of Nazareth is righteous. That is, he is in a right relationship with God. He is what he claimed to be in every aspect of what he claimed to be. The Messiah, the one who is the Savior of the world. How do I know that? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thus, reproving the world, convicting the world of righteousness. And specifically here, the righteousness of Christ. Then, third, the area of convicting the world of judgment. The, in, the general application of judgment is generally condemnation. Here it is that the prince of this world is judge. The prince of the world in this occasion is Satan. And by proving that Jesus the, is the Messiah, the Christ, he is God's son, how? By the resurrection from the dead, he condemns Satan. The power and dominion of Satan is destroyed. And he no longer has the ability to uh, empower, enslave us no longer has power over us because it's been destroyed by Jesus Christ. Thus, judgment. Satan is destroyed. His power is destroyed. Now, that's the work that the Spirit is going to be doing. But Jesus not only tells us the work of the Spirit, he also tells us how he's going to accomplish that work. Now, how is it going to be? It's not going to be as Calvinism teaches, some still small voice in the night, some feeling that I get in my gut, whether it be a sickness or whatever it might be. That's not the way the Spirit's going to work. It's not going to be by some better felt than told experience. If you look at what Jesus says to the apostles, he says, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot stand them now. They were not spiritually mature enough at that point in time. Maybe that's a lesson for us sometimes. How many times do we think someone who becomes a Christian and a little bit of time passes, and they ought to know these things by now? These men had spent three and a half years approximately with the greatest teacher that's ever lived upon the face of the earth, and yet they were still not mature enough to understand certain things. They weren't. And so what was going to do? I'm going to send the Spirit unto you. He's going to be baptizing you in the Spirit or with the Spirit. And he's going to then accomplish his work. How? By guiding the apostles into all truth and showing them things to come. And then when we go back and add chapter 14, verse 25 and 26, that these things I have spoken to you, being yet present with you, but when the Comforter, which, the, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. We already see see that and that he would guide them into all truth and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you and so how is the spirit going to accomplish that work of reproving the world of sin righteousness and judgment well here's how he's going to do it he's going to guide the apostles into all truth he's going to show them things to come and he's going to bring to their remembrance all that Jesus said now that's how he's going to accomplish the work now then, how do we see that at being applied? Well, we've already noted from Luke 24, verse 49, 
in Acts 1, verse 4 and verse 5, that Jesus told the apostles to remain in Jerusalem till what? Till they receive this spirit that he's promising them here in John 14, 15, and 16. To do what? So that he could accomplish his work of convicting the world of sin, convicting the world of righteousness, convicting the world of judgment to come. How? By guiding the apostles into all truth. And by the way, that's the apostles, not us today, as some want to try and make it apply to. Guiding them into all truth, showing them things to come, bringing to their, to their remembrance all things that Jesus had said. And so here they are in Jerusalem. And in Acts the second chapter, verses 1 through 4, the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles. And notice verse 4 again, that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. What is that? That's exactly what Jesus had promised to them, to the apostles, not to us today. And notice that the apostles began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were speaking the words that the Holy Spirit was giving them in guiding them into all truth, in bringing to their remembrance all that Jesus had said, in showing them things to come. To do what? For the purpose of reproving the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. How was the Spirit accomplishing His work? Through the apostles speaking words. That's how He's going to accomplish His work. And so as we continue on, we start seeing that. Notice verses 5 through verse 13. We generally refer to this as very simply the gathering of the multitude. All these Jews and proselytes from all over the world gathering. Why? Well, notice verse 6. When, they, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak. Who speak? The apostles were speaking. In his own language. The apostles were speaking. For what purpose? For the Spirit to accomplish his work of reproving the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's the purpose of their speaking. And they were being guided into all truth. Being shown things to come. And, yes, brought to remembrance all that Jesus taught to accomplish that work of the Spirit, but he was doing it through the words that the apostles were speaking. Now then, consider his message. And this is again the Spirit's message through the apostles to accomplish his work. He begins, well, we're not drunk as some men are claiming, but this is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. And that goes right back to Joel 2 that we began this with. Just real quickly passed over it though. And at the end of that prophecy though, as recorded and as quoted here by Peter, notice verse 21 of Acts 2, It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now then, this is a statement of the Spirit convicting the world of righteousness. How can I be righteous? How can you be righteous? Well, it's going to come about when the Spirit is poured out upon the world. And that includes what's happening now. So that the Spirit can accomplish His work of conviction. And you're going to be shown how to be convicted of righteousness. That is, how you can be in a right relationship with God. How you can be saved. But then he goes into a discussion of convicting the world of the righteousness of Christ. Notice verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Why? Doesn't the Spirit come in my heart and just give me an old fuzzy feeling? No, I, the Spirit's going to accomplish His work by words. So hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God. 
among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. The Spirit's going to start accomplishing his work by the use of words. And he shows Jesus of Nazareth was approved of God. What is it? Jesus of Nazareth was someone who was righteous. Convicting them of righteousness. The righteousness of Christ. But they had taken Jesus and by wicked hands crucified and slain him. But God raised him from the dead. Look at verse 24. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which proved Jesus to be the Son of God. Romans 1, 4. The Spirit, by the use of the words that he was having Peter speak, inspiring Peter to speak, was convicting them of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that he was God's Son. What is it? He is accomplishing his work which he set forth or which Jesus set forth in John 16. Then Peter goes from that to show how that Jesus or that God had prophesied of Jesus righteousness. That God would raise him up and make him king by sitting him at his own right hand. And he quotes prophecies from David as evidence of that righteousness of Christ. That he was who he says he was. He is truly the Son of God. And he is now sitting and ruling at David or at God's right hand sitting on David's throne. Which is God's throne, one and the same. And then he comes down to verse 36. And he says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Again, we see the Spirit's work of convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He reproved the world of sin in this very statement, in that they had by wicked hands crucified the Son of God. But he was also reproving the world of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and the fact that God raised him up from the dead. And that he is, and it again reproves the world of judgment, that the prince of this world is judged, and the fact that Jesus Christ is now both Lord and Christ. The very meaning of Lord is one who is a master, who is a ruler. The power of Satan has been destroyed and Jesus Christ is now on the throne. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. What is it? The Spirit was accomplishing His work. How? By the use of words. Now then look at verse 37. Now when they felt this. No. It's when they heard this. Heard what? heard what the Spirit was stating in reproving the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He was accomplishing his work when they heard the message that Peter was speaking. They were pricked in their hearts and they said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? The Spirit had been inspiring these words and go back to verse 4 now. And you see that very thing. The Spirit... Guiding them, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And through those words, the Spirit was accomplishing His work of reproving the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. We know that the hearers on that occasion were convicted of their sin because we look at the question that they ask. Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were pricked in their hearts. Word means to cut through. They were cut through to the heart. Why? Because they had been convicted of the sin, specific sin, of crucifying the very Son of God. Now that's what the Spirit's work was all about. And thus the question, what shall we do? We've been convicted of our sin. We know that we're wicked. We have taken by wicked hands and crucified God's Son. What shall we do? And so, 
The Spirit now is going to convict them of righteousness. How they can be righteous. He had already introduced it in, back in verse 21 though. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, now what does he tell them? Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. You've been convicted of your sins now. How do you alleviate that problem of sin? When you repent and are baptized, then your sins will be washed away and you will be in that right relationship with God. Your sins will be taken away. They will be remitted. But also in doing this, the Spirit is convicting the world of judgment. It is proving Jesus to be God's Son. And He is destroying thus Satan's dominion and power to enslave men. Again, God has shown that this Jesus, whom you have crucified, is both Lord, what is it? Someone who has dominion. Someone who has the power. Satan no longer has the power of control. He no longer has the ability to enslave that individual who repents and is baptized. Turn over Romans 6 chapter for just a second. And you start seeing this. Because in that act of baptism that we see in verse 3 and verse 4, being baptized into the death of Christ, buried with him by baptism into death, raised from that water grave of baptism to walk in newness of life, what do you find then? That old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin, verse 6 and verse 7. In verse 10, he that, for in that he hath died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. That's what the Christian is. He dies to sin to live to God. Why? Because sin no longer has power over him. The power of sin has been destroyed by, by Christ. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Verse 14, Sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but under grace. Verse 18, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And you have your fruit in, uh, well, verse 22, but now being made free from sin, you became the servants of, of, to God. You have your fruit unto holiness. And the end, everlasting life. That's why... The Christian is not a sinner. <laughs> so many times we hear Christians say, Oh, we're nothing but sinners. Well, if you're a sinner, you're not a Christian. He makes a distinction. This individual over here who was a sinner, who was through his repentance and baptism, Satan no longer has power over him, and he now has the right to live unto God. He's freed from that old man of sin. So he can live in righteousness to God and have that fruit unto holiness. Why? Because the Spirit is accomplishing His work in convicting the world of righteousness and of judgment. How we can be right and that the prince of this world is judge. He no longer has power. He no longer has control. And we can now live in righteousness. And so the Spirit is warning people to free themselves from that dominion of sin. And so we see with in verse 40, with many other what? Words. Why? Because the Spirit is trying to accomplish His work. And how is He going to do it? He's going to do it through the use of words. With many other words did He testify and exhort. He's trying to convict them of righteousness. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. This what? This generation that is wicked and crooked and perverse. What is it? That's conviction of sin of that individual who has not saved themselves. How? By repentance and baptism. And so we see continued aspect of that conviction of the world of sin. 
that they are a wicked and perverse generation, a conviction of righteousness, how we can be in a right relationship with God through our repentance and baptism, and how that we are no longer under the control of Satan because the prince of this world is judged. And so those who were baptized, verse 41, and notice, they that gladly received the word. The Spirit was working and accomplishing his work by the use of the words that he was inspiring the apostles to speak. And when they received that word, they were baptized. What is it? They were coming into a right relationship with God. The Spirit convicting them of righteousness and emancipating themselves from the fetters of sin and Satan and the judgment, the condemnation that that brings. But now then, to remain in that saved state, that righteous state, what do they need to do? Look at verse 42. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Where doctrine means teaching. The apostles continued to teach. What is it? They continued to use the words that the Spirit was guiding them so that they could accomplish, the, so that that work of righteousness could continue to be accomplished. Keeping them in that right relationship with God. Now then... I just mentioned very briefly a couple of other passages. Or we'll probably just mention one, Ephesians 3 and verse 16. Because it seems to be a pet passage in relationship to some individuals that the Spirit is going to strengthen the Ephesians. That five minutes that I gave back uh, the, the other day, I'm going to take to not today. <laughs> that he would grant you, Paul writes, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his, by his Spirit in the inner man. Paul mentions here the fact of the Spirit's strengthening. But he does not mention here how the Spirit is going to accomplish that fact. Now how do we know that he's going to accomplish it? If we go back to what we've just went, gone over in, from John the 14th, 15th, and 16th chapters. That's how it's going to be accomplished. And by the use of words. Now how do we know that? Well, we turn over to Acts 20th chapter. Paul has called for the elders at Ephesus. So these same ones that Paul is writing this to and says that the Spirit is going to strengthen your inner man... Now, how is it going to be accomplished? You look what he says to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 and verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to do what? Strengthen you. Which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. And if you look at that, build you up to give you an inheritance. Why are you given an inheritance? Because prince of this world is judge and that power of sin you don't have to live according to and you can be strengthened you can be built up in Christ how by the word of his grace that's how so Ephesians 3 shows us the fact of the spirit's strengthening but we're told how back in Acts 20th chapter and verse 32 but we're also told how over in chapter 6 of Ephesians when Paul is giving the the spirit's arm or the armor that we are to put on as Christians. And he tells us to take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. How is the spirit going to accomplish his work? How is he going to strengthen the inner man? By the word of God. That's how. And thus, when we study, and there's a, you could really look at several other passages, but we don't have time it always works in the same way. That the Spirit is going to accomplish His work of reproving the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. How? 
by the use of words as he inspired the apostles to speak and then to write down. And in Revelation, the second and third chapters, we see that, that they were to listen to what the Spirit says. But what were they doing? They were reading the message, the words. And so they wrote down that which the Spirit guided them to do to accomplish his work. And we, when we read then, can understand the mysteries of Christ. Ephesians, the third chapter, and verses 1 through 5. Now then, let me just very briefly mention a couple of erroneous doctrines. And one we can't help but mention is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some claim that it is even for us today. That when we are baptized in water, we are baptized also in the Holy Spirit. That's two baptisms, by the way, and Paul says there's one, not two. But they ignore that. When you understand the purpose of the Spirit and the work of the Spirit and how he's going to accomplish his Spirit, you see that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was given only to the apostles. Why? To accomplish the work of the Spirit in reproving the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. There is no need for the baptism of the Holy Spirit of anyone by anyone today. Why? Because we have the word that the Spirit has revealed, and that word does the work that the Spirit is supposed to accomplish, reproving the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Thus, we don't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit today. We have the word that he has given but also the false doctrine of the direct working of the Spirit upon the heart of man. Calvinism's view was that the Spirit works in conviction, conversion, and sanctification. Wesley's view, which many Christians today are holding, is that he only works in sanctification. But that, again, comes from a misunderstanding of the Spirit's work. And when we understand the Spirit's work and how he accomplishes it through the Word, we see that that work is done indirectly through the Word of God, and he does not need that direct access to the human heart. I hope this will help you in your study of the Holy Spirit. Michael, when I came up here a while ago, did you say something to me? Thought it hurt the wind blowing. Uh, thought it might have been you. That was a, a good lesson, a very important lesson. If you take people away from the Word of God, there's no understanding God or salvation. And even the Holy Spirit approaches us through the instructive powers of His sword, which is the Word of God. What all He does on our behalf, who can tell me? Tell me right now what the Holy Spirit's doing. Specifically, what's he doing right now? Okay, tell me right now, Christ ruling over the kingdom, what particulars and details is he involved in? Oh, well, he's mediating for us. He ever lived with to make intercession for us, all right? Tell me what that means. That is, details, what all is that involving right now? Uh, anybody want to tell me what the host of angels are doing right now? What's the Father doing right now? So what all goes on is he answers our prayers and providentially protects us and guides us, and he can strengthen us through providence and so forth. That's fine. But as far as knowing what God said to do to be saved and remain saved and the details of all of that, I have to have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, instructing me. That's why Paul said, preach the Word. And we must do that. I appreciate it. We ought to, ought to all of us study more about the work of the Spirit and knowing that there are a number of things that we might not be able to understand the details on. Whatever God's revealed to us pertaining to what we must do to be saved from our sins, must do to be a faithful child of God, is going to be set out because that's our responsibility. God's done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, what we can do. He has set out the truth in his word, the sword of the spirit. So let's be sure and keep that in mind. Michael has stayed at our house for a number of years. He's been a great friend. Danny's been with us. And uh, 
I appreciate very much them being there. It gives us time to visit. And you can tell Michael stays up too late at times with us. But uh, if you don't know Michael in the sense of his ways at night, he likes to go to bed about 9 or 9.30 and get up between 3 and 4 every day. Now, I don't care what he does doing that as long as he doesn't disturb me. <laughs> One morning, I couldn't sleep. I got up and just went to work. I learned a long time ago not to try to lay there and think about things. I could on up and go to the computer. About the time I was on the computer and online, I saw Michael come online. He said, what are you doing getting up this early? I said, I haven't been to bed. He said, well, I'm just getting up. It's both about 3 o'clock in the morning. So a lot of times you can engage in a lot of good work, and we appreciate all the efforts. I, I might mention this. Uh, Ken gave me a terrible slur yesterday, Ken Cone. He's been known to do things like that once in a blue moon. But uh, he looked at my beard, and he said that I looked like an apostate reprobate and then he gave my, the name now that's by implication he didn't say apostate reprobate but when he said I looked like Joseph Metter I knew he he meant that um, what do you think about Michael <laughs> thanks a lot well it looks more like a Neanderthal to me. <laughs> so we're staying adjourned for just about five minutes.